And so it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Wayne Hall, um, who's joining us from Brisbane uh, this morning or your evening. Uh, Wayne's a superior of mine, and um, he's been uh, massively influential in drug policy um, throughout his career. Well, he's emeritus professor now. He's also been the lead of a number of um, centers for addiction and drug research, but um, the and worked. Or did you, were you the leader of the, the uh, National Centre for Addiction in King's, or you worked in King's College here? I worked, worked in King's, yeah, yeah, as a professor. Yeah, yeah. In the National Addiction Centre, but also um, the National's NDARC, the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre in Sydney, and then latterly in the Centre for Youth Substance Use in the um, University of Queensland. He's advised the World Health Organisation, and um, he's got an extraordinary number of papers. Um, and he's, he's, um, he's advised um, a number of national and international bodies on drug policy. And he's turned his lens um, through COVID, and I think Wayne will explain some of the context to psychedelics. So um, it will be really fascinating, I think, to hear his take on and a kind of the long view of um, psychedelics over the 21st century. So um, I'll hand over to you now, Wayne. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe just stand here to admit people. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Celia. Um, as you indicated, uh, the topic of psychedelics is not something I've actively done research in. In the course of the COVID uh, pandemic and the lockdown, I read Michael Pollan's book, uh, Changing uh, Your Mind, and got quite interested in the history which I didn't dabble in before. And this is the result uh, of that. Uh, I, the, the slides themselves don't have lots of detail the citations in it, but at the very end of the talk, I'll put up a list of my papers I've published, which include the information uh, to support the sorts of uh, arguments I've put. Some declarations of interest. Um, a long time ago, uh, 17 years ago, I signed an amicus curiae brief. That's a, a, a brief given to the US Supreme Court in support of the religious use of ayahuasca by a, a Brazilian religious group, uh, which was uh, the US Supreme Court upheld that uh, appeal and uh, recognized it. I've also collaborated with two uh, English researchers who'd be well known to this audience, Amanda Fielding and David Nutt, but not in the area of psychedelic research. Uh, and I should sort of as a personal declaration indicate that I'm much more skeptical of many things than many of the advocates have been of the therapeutic claims, skeptical in general about therapeutic claims and uh, a more specific autobiographical fact is I lived through the first psychedelic era in Australia, so I can remember what it was like way back then, more in the early 70s here than the late 60s as it was in the US. So I'll, I'll briefly uh, go through the European discovery of these, the early medical uses made of psychedelic drugs in the 50s and 60s, then talk about why research ended in the 1970s, making the case, I think, from recent historical research that it wasn't simply because of the war on drugs, although that's the standard narrative that we hear repeated uh, nowadays. I'll talk briefly about the reasons for the renewed interest in the therapeutic use of these drugs, particularly for psilocybin uh, in depression and MDMA and post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll talk about the resurgent interest in psychedelics, the treatment of addiction, uh, obviously a, a topic of great interest to your group, given the uh, trial uh, that, that was done um, recently, Celia and colleagues. And I'll end with some debates, of, uh, talking about debates around how psychedelic drugs should be regulated for medical and non-medical or so-called adult use. I guess the first point to make is, uh, is, again, well known to this audience, that the concept of a psychedelic drug is not a well-defined entity. Uh, this was the definition that Grinspoon and Bacala uh, gave back in their book, uh, Psychedelic Drugs Reconsidered attempting to capture the, the sort of uh, strange and interesting effects that these drugs have on thought, mood and perception uh, and the similarity between the experiences that people report under the influence of these drugs and religious and contemplative uh, experiences uh, in the absence of a lot of the sort of more uh, sort of psychopathology that surrounds say, acute psychosis or uh, intoxication and delirium. 
So what are the psychedelic drugs? Well, the so-called classic psychedelics, uh, LSD, psilocybin, and mescaline. Uh, there's more recently the, the term has included MDMA, ketamine, DMT, and a variety of other drugs. I noticed just in the last week, the new journal Psychedelic Medicine had uh, a sort of consensus statement on, or attempted a consensus statement on what psychedelic drugs are, uh, indicating a preference for the classic uh, psychedelics, those that uh, act uh, on the 5H2, 2, uh, 2A receptor, uh, rather than the broader class, although the, the journal uh, is prepared to uh, publish articles on drugs that have similar effects. So I, I guess this part of the story is probably well known to this audience about the discovery of uh, LSD by Albert Hoffman uh, in his isolation of psilocybin from mushrooms that were given to uh, him uh, by an American ethnobotanist to obtain it from a Mexican healer. Um, uh, there's Hoffman, a sort of in psychedelic garb. He's an unlikely hero of the psychedelic movement, given that he was an extremely conservative, if not right wing in a lot of his politics and beliefs and very disapproving of Timothy Leary and uh, the use made of uh, LSD and other psychedelic drugs by the counterculture. Uh, these, of course, are the, the psilocybin mushrooms that uh, many varieties of these drugs, uh, of these mushrooms that contain this particular drug. The more interesting thing, uh, I think, is that the, the drug that first uh, attracted attention wasn't LSD or psilocybin because we, they weren't really isolated until uh, or psilocybin until the 1960s, but it was mescaline, which had been around, uh, isolated and synthesized at the turn of the century. And there was a brief flurry of interest in them in the 1930s when a variety of psychiatrists, including some pretty establishment figures, took the drug and reported on their experiences and suggested, given the effect of these drugs and the similarity to some of the experiences of psychoses, that you know, the hypothesis uh, was proposed that schizophrenia was uh, a disorder caused by a toxic amine, a naturally occurring substance or some uh, metabolite of it that uh, produced these uh, unusual experiences. Osmond and Hoffa, who were, uh, will come up in, in the context of early uh, research on LSD and the treatment of alcohol dependence, were initially interested in uh, these drugs as model psychoses, and they conjectured that adrenochrome, the metabolite of adrenaline, was the toxic amine that was responsible for psychoses. And they claimed to be able to treat psychoses using megadoses of uh, niacin. Their work didn't really get a lot of uh, support. There were other researchers who did work uh, largely on the effects of uh, dopamine uh, agonists. And this was work really that came about in the late fifties with the reports of amphetamine psychoses by Connell and others, particularly in London. People taking very large doses of methamphetamine uh, developed auditory hallucinations and paranoid delusions that were really difficult to distinguish from those of schizophrenia. And of course, this was also the period when chlorpromazine and other uh, phenothiazines were developed and found to reduce the severity of psychotic symptoms and appeared to act on the dopamine system. So the dopaminergic theory of psychosis really uh, overtook uh, the sort of Osman and Hoffa hypotheses at the time. Uh, Osman relocated to Saskatchewan in Canada in the early 1950s and was given responsibility for running uh, several very large mental hospitals with thousands of patients in them and a very large group of their patient load consists of people with alcoholism. And he and Hoffa uh, thought uh, possibly under the influence of their own LSD that they could give large doses of this drug to alcoholics and potentially scare them into sobriety uh, by producing delirium tremens like experiences that they thought would motivate them to become abstinent. They treated a grand total of two patients uh, and then turned the problem over to the younger colleagues in the mental hospitals uh, who went on to treat uh, reasonable numbers, probably several hundred patients uh, using LSD uh, to treat alcohol dependence. And they reported that most of these patients didn't have the sort of frightening experiences that were intended initially. They more often reported 
mystical experiences or epiphanies that uh, convinced them that there was more to, to life than uh, being an alcoholic and drinking, and many of them uh, stopped. And Osman and Hoffa encouraged them uh, after their experiences to join the local AA group uh, and to use the AA support to sustain abstinence thereafter. They were using pretty high doses of LSD by the standards of the doses typically used for recreational purposes, four to 500 milligram micrograms, on the assumption that people who were alcohol dependent were required, were tolerant to the effects of many drugs and so would require much larger doses of, of these drugs to get effects. And they were reporting abstinence rates 50% uh, in six months after treatment. And uh, this became the standard form of treatment in the Saskatchewan mental hospital system. And there were various other people in Canada who took it up as well. Understandably, there were uh, skeptics about who pointed out that these were uncontrolled studies in very small numbers of patients. There were no comparison groups. Outcome was assessed by self-reported abstinence. And it depended critically on the veracity of patients and clinicians. And uh, Osmond and Hoffa were quite enthusiastic about encouraging their clinicians to use LSD. And in some cases, the clinicians were using the drug at the same time as the patients. Uh, this sort of uh, practice tended to raise suspicions about the credibility of the people doing the research. Uh, I guess the other thing about the, uh, the early treatment was the emphasis given to the psychedelic mystical experiences, which didn't go down well with people researching for purely pharmacological treatments. So interest in the treatment declined as a number of randomized controlled trials were performed, um, which by the early 60s was required for any new treatment. And the uh, randomized controlled trials tended to find some evidence of uh, greater rates of abstinence in the short term from LSD. But the longer people were followed, the less difference there were between people given LSD and uh, whatever the comparative uh, comparison treatment was. A recent meta-analysis of these trials did find better outcomes in the two to six month period in those given LSD, but no differences in outcome uh, 12 months after treatment. So though, for those sorts of reasons, a lot of interest was lost in it. And the other important thing, again, one of those institutional factors that tends to get neglected in histories is that the, there was a change of government in Saskatchewan. There was no longer support for the, the sort of approach that Osman and Hoffa were taking. They left and moved on and their staff was sort of spread throughout the system. And so the uh, knowledge and expertise in the use of this treatment uh, was ra rather uh, dispersed. An important figure whose role I hadn't appreciated until I got into reading a lot of this history is Aldous Huxley. Uh, as, as people would well know, he had a, an experience with mescaline, uh, which was given to him by Humphrey Osmond. And he wrote a, a very influential short uh, essay, uh, The Doors of Perception, uh, in which he advocated the use of mescaline and more and latterly uh, LSD and other psychedelics for the purposes of spiritual enlightenment. And, and his account of his experiences uh, was very influential in I think in, uh, influencing the set of many people's personal experiences with psychedelic drugs thereafter. And he, in fact, advocated it as a harm reduction alternative to alcohol and tobacco. And uh, his memorable phrase, chemical vacations for intolerable self. Um, he moved on to using LSD later, uh, as did uh, Hoffer and Osmond and other early pioneers, largely because it required smaller doses uh, in micrograms rather than the larger doses of mescaline that were, were used in early research, and it appeared to have fewer adverse effects. One thing I think that's forgotten is we're well aware of the bad press that LSD got, particularly in the late 60s and early 70s. But for a large part of the 1950s and early 60s, the press coverage of LSD and its use in therapy was incredibly positive. Thanks to Henry Luce, who was the publisher of Time magazine and Life magazine, he was an enthusiast for LSD. We had celebrity endorsers like Cary Grant, the movie actor, various Silicon Valley pioneers who used the drug and um, the sort of advocacy of its use for spiritual purposes uh, by Huxley was very influential for Leary as Huxley met Leary and, and encouraged him. 
Huxley disapproved of Leary's democratization of access to these. He had a, a view that trickle down theory of psychedelic enlightenment that these drugs should only be used by the intellectual elite uh, and they in their turn could uh, uh, wise up the, the, the uh, sort of the plebs uh, about the value of these particular drugs. So he was not uh, a great supporter of the idea that you just give it out willy nilly to anybody. Um, which of course was pretty much what Timothy Leary and others like Ken Kesey did. Uh, Leary became probably the most prominent advocate of the use of these drugs for spiritual and other purposes, uh, based on work that he began at Harvard University in the early 1960s uh, in giving psilocybin. Uh, and he was largely left the university in the face of considerable criticism from colleagues about his research and the spread of uh, LSD into the student culture at Harvard at the time. Ken Kesey, the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, was a West Coast evangelist for the same purposes, but he was very much even more democratic than Leary, advocating that uh, anybody should use LSD and do so for fun. And of course, he hosted electric Kool Aid acid tests, which uh, Tom Wolfe has uh, described in a popular book with that title. It also leaked into popular culture and music, uh, and a lot of this produced broad societal alarm and the banning initially in California in 1965 of LSD uh, and later uh, 1970 uh, nationally in the US. Uh, and the popularity of the drug and its ban, of course, just generated a large scale illicit uh, production of these drugs and widespread use amongst uh, young people in the US, particularly in the late 60s and early 70s. As Ken Kesey and the bus that he used to travel around the US evangelizing the use of uh, LSD uh, and psychedelics. And of course, uh, Hutter S. Thompson was another popular figure in uh, popularizing the use of psychedelics uh, for recreation and fun, um, who didn't, who famously said that the mistake that Leary and others made was in assuming that there was a, a being called God who was at the end of the tunnel, men, uh, uh, tending the light that people saw when they took these drugs. He was a, an unbeliever. And of course, the, the Beatles album, uh, Sgt. Pepper, was very much influenced by uh, the, the Beatles' experiences with these drugs. There are also less uh, uh, sort of savoury aspects of the early experience, which are sometimes forgotten. The first of these, Charles Manson's probably the most infamous, uh, who very actively used LSD. He was a, a, a career a criminal who'd been involved in a, a lot of fairly serious crime, was released from prison into San Francisco at the time of the, the uh, Summer of Love and uh, introduced to LSD and convinced himself that he was the son of man and proceeded to convince a lot of followers that he attracted that he in fact was uh, man, son, son of man and induced them to commit some fairly gruesome murders that gave a lot of bad press to LSD. Australia had its own small version of a similar cult uh, in the 1970s into the 1980s. Carlos Castaneda published a best-selling book or a series of books which turned out to be based on plagiarism and uh, fraud, uh, appropriating other people's work. Um, and the Weather Underground who were involved in acts of revolutionary and violence were, were also enthusiasts for LSD. And in fact, sprang uh, Timothy Leary from the California prison where he was serving a sentence for cannabis possession. Probably less well known is that the Rasnish or free love cult was largely run on MDMA. Um, in the 1980s, uh, there was versions of that in Australia as well and had friends who uh, were sucked into that particular cult. The US military were of course also interested. The CIA and um, the US Army were experimenting with psychedelic drugs for various nefarious purposes and engaged in some egregiously unethical research that often involved giving people LSD without their knowledge or consent. Um, and there were deaths, uh, as you could imagine, people uh, having a, a full-blown psychedelic experience without any preparation or knowledge that it was a drug-induced uh, could have a devastating effect and there were several deaths, uh, people taking the drug under those circumstances. 
So given all that, that sort of background of what was going on in the 60s and into the 70s, uh, why did research stop? Well, the, the standard account that's often given is all down to Richard Nixon's, everybody's favorite bogeyman. But there were a whole lot of other things going on that made it much more difficult to do research on these drugs uh, beginning in the 1960s. And the first of these was the tightening of uh, regulation around clinical research after the thalidomide scandal in 1961. Before then, any clinician who wanted to do research, so-called, could uh, get hold of drugs often for free from the company and give them to their patients without any uh, research protocol, any supervision, any ethical uh, oversight or what have you, just to see what happened. And of course, that was how a lot of the early uh, antipsychotic drugs and drugs like lithium were investigated. Uh, so LSD, uh, the use of it by uh, Osman and Hoffer was not unusual, it was, was pretty standard practice at the time. But as a consequence of the thalidomide uh, scandal, Congress passed new regulations that required formal clinical trial notifications, animal safety data, uh, and evidence from uh, randomized controlled trials of the safety and efficacy of these drugs before they could be approved for uh, therapeutic use. Uh, so those things were making it harder, and a lot of the early researchers like Osman and Hoffer were not trained clinicians. They weren't trained in doing clinical trials. They were primarily busy clinicians with large patient practices who were doing a bit of research on the side. So they weren't really in, in, in the business of doing or developing the protocols required for the trials by the FDA. The other thing that happened, of course, was Sandos, which had the patents on uh, both LSD and psilocybin, which expired in 1965, decided that it was going to get out of uh, providing the drug and supporting clinical trials, uh, largely because they were worried about their reputation uh, as a result of the activities of Leary and others and the publicity around uh, the fallout and adverse effects from the use of these drugs largely by young people in unsupervised settings. There were certainly other contributing factors as well. There were professional concerns about the way in which these drugs were being used therapeutically well before Leary. Uh, in uh, Los Angeles in the 1950s, the mid to late 1950s, Sidney Cohen, who was a very early investigator of these drugs, started seeing practice that he was alarmed by. He ended up treating some casualties of uh, bad therapeutic uses of it. And he and others became concerned about um, what's since been called the irrational exuberance that uh, some people started to express about these uh, drugs in, in thinking that uh, they were going to solve humanity's problems. Uh, and there was also reported, and this is reported by some contemporary investigators who have been involved in the revival of research, when they were young researchers and, and expressed an interest in doing work on these drugs, they were told that they would be a a terrible career uh, error, the so-called snigger factor, the, the suspicion of anybody who expressed an interest in doing research on psychedelic drugs uh, meant that um, people were discouraged from doing it. Despite all these challenges, it is interesting that research didn't stop, as is often said in 1970, it continued well into the 70s, with NIH funding into the early 70s and in the state of Maryland in the US as late as 1979. Clinical trials were being funded by the state government there of uh, psychedelic drugs in the treatment of a variety of um, psychiatric disorders. So the, the, the story about how it ended and why it ended, I think is more complicated than the, the standard account that we see uh, often in, in reports nowadays. So what's brought about the psychedelic revival? Well, certainly there's been some continuity. Some of the people involved in the revival were around the first time, Rick Doblin being one, Bob Jesse, who's uh, an internet uh, founder and uh, pioneer who's funded some of the early work by Doblin and the MAPS group. And many of these early researchers had what might be described as transformative personal experiences with psychedelic drugs and were keen enough, in Doblin's case, he made it a life mission went off and did a PhD at Harvard, learning how to do research that would satisfy the FDA. Um, so a, a real personal commitment in his case to doing research on this. And he managed to attract funding from philanthropists um, to do this work. 
What's different about the, the current research, I think, is it's been led by scientists in major universities in the US, UK, and EU. They've often been trained in psychopharmacology and neuroscience. They've got the expertise to do the necessary randomized control trials, and they've also been doing neuroimaging studies of the mechanisms of drug action. And a lot of this work has been published in very high impact uh, peer reviewed journals such as Nature Medicine, Nature, New England Journal of Medicine, and so on. So the, the current revival is, is uh, it's like chalk and cheese compared to the very early research that was done, done for, for obvious reasons. The reasons for renewed interest, I, I guess I don't need to go through this with uh, this audience, but clearly there's been since the early 2000s a series of small uh, clinical trials uh, showing promising results uh, in the treatment of anxiety and depression of the terminal ill and intractably depressed, and in the use of MDNA to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. There's also a lot of new uh, interest in neuroimaging research on mechanisms of the action of these drugs. And I think the, the other factor which sucked me into looking at this again has been the sympathetic reappraisals of the early research by groups of historians, particularly in, in the province of Saskatchewan, who got back into the clinical records and and uh, looked at how the research in the 1950s and 60s was done and to evaluate it against the standards of, of the day and to look critically at the reasons why this research was abandoned. And I think one shouldn't discount the, the value of very popular books like Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. Uh, he's a, you know, a very good science, popular science journalist who's written a very accessible book that uh, has interested a lot of people in these drugs and, their, and in their therapeutic potential. So the research that's been done uh, primarily in the case of uh, depression has been on psilocybin rather than LSD, uh, in part because of its pharmacology, it being simpler pharmacology, shorter acting, fewer bad trips, but also critically, it doesn't ca carry the cultural baggage of LSD. And it's been used to treat common mental illnesses or mental disorders that are not well treated. We do have drug treatments for them, but they're not fabulously effective. So there is a, a need to develop a broader range of more effective treatments for disorders like depression, anxiety, alcoholism, and other disorders. The positive results in small uh, end trials of psilocybin led the FDA to give it breakthrough drug status to facilitate research and its approval. And we've also seen very similar results in the early trials of MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. And David Nutt and his colleagues have been doing a lot of neuroimaging work on these drugs at Imperial College in London. So how effective are they? Well, it's probably still early days in part because the, the funding really hasn't been there until really recently to do the large scale trials that are required to uh, provide clear answers to these questions. And there are major challenges in, in assessing the effectiveness of these drugs in the standard uh, double blind placebo control trials, largely because placebo controls really don't work. It's just difficult to disguise the fact from a patient that they've received a psychedelic drug. Uh, and in part because it's not just the drug, it's the drug, the set setting and the sort of psychotherapy which is wrapped around it that is part of the therapeutic package. And you can't do all those things without patients knowing uh, what sort of treatment they, they're getting. I don't think that's absolutely uh, um, sort of rules out uh, assessments of the effect of these drugs, but it does make it more important that uh, outcomes are assessed blindly um, by raters and that we have much longer term follow ups given the history of short term positive results that tend to wash out over time. The other concern, of course, is that all the trials are positive and have been conducted by advocates of psychedelic use. Um, so the skeptics would, would like to see the results reproduced uh, by less committed researchers in longer, larger studies, uh, particularly ones that don't select out uh, patients with uh, comorbidities uh, and are more representative of the sorts of patients who are likely to receive these drugs if they are approved for clinical use. Again, this is not a, a specific criticism to psychedelic drugs. The same criticisms made historically of pharmaceutical companies uh, the trials that they tend to fund look a lot better, the results look a lot better than the results 
that come out when uh, disinterested third parties do trials of, say, SSRI antidepressants or um, uh, atypical anti uh, psychotic drugs. So the psilocybin for depression is probably the most advanced in, in terms of trials. And we've seen some large clinically significant and immediate reductions in depressive symptoms. Uh, rates reported as high as 70%, but have been maintained at 12 months uh, follow-up. And most of these patients reporting them as sort of mystical experiences that uh, the early researchers reported and which appear to predict better patient outcomes. Just in the last couple of weeks, Compass has published uh, an open label dosing study of single dose psilocybin, uh, reporting clinical remission rates quite a bit less than the 70% in the trials uh, conducted earlier, uh, but still uh, superior to that of placebo. And I think these sorts of results are looking a bit more uh, believable, probably because the patients have been less selected and then in. A lot of the early trials, substantial numbers of those patients have had prior experience with psychedelics and uh, they often had, uh, didn't have comorbid disorders, which made treatment look a bit better than it might otherwise have been. One could say that the same very much about MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. Um, in this case, it's more a, a non-directive, what I'd describe as psychodynamic light uh, type of therapy. Uh, that Rick Doblin has uh, sort of adapted from the work of Stanislav Groff and others. And on the basis of these uh, uh, results, it's also been given breakthrough drug status by the FDA. And large scale trials are now uh, underway and, and results beginning to be reported. Interestingly, it's psychedelics and the treatment of addiction that's lagged behind because the focus on the much uh, more prevalent. Uh, forms of disorder like depression and more uh, chronic ones such as PTSD. And partly because the clientele, people with alcohol and drug problems, aren't uh, often in a position to pay for treatment in the way patients with depression and PTSD may be. But there's uh, a reasonable number of studies here, of early small scale trials demonstrating proof of principle and uh, providing evidence of the the value in doing uh, further large-scale trials. And of course, just in this year, in the past year, we've seen the Bogan Schultz work um, uh, on psilocybin and alcohol dependence. Uh, the trial wasn't as large as they'd hoped, thanks to COVID, they had to uh, finish it prematurely. But again, the results were uh, reasonably encouraging, or pretty encouraging in terms of uh, reductions in heavy drinking days uh, in the group that were given psilocybin. And so the, the authors were fairly careful not to overclaim and were really arguing that this study made the case for a much larger randomised control trials. And of course, the, the work of the group that Celia Morgan and colleagues have done around adjunctive uh, use of ketamine in the treatment of alcohol use disorders. Again, uh, promising results and encouraging uh, for further large scale trials, which one would hope uh, the usual funding bodies uh, would be prepared to fund now that these sorts of data uh, are available. How safe are they? Uh, this is uh, an issue I guess regulators are a bit concerned about. Certainly in the their medical use in the 1960s, there were a few adverse events reported. But Doblin uh, pointed out that the Good Friday experiment, mm -hmm. there was one, one of the patients in that very small study had developed psychotic symptoms and had to be medicated with uh, one of the phenothiazines, uh, but that wasn't just written up in any of the reports of the study. So one wonders the extent to which any bad news was sort of swept under the carpet in some of the early work. There were certainly many more adverse events reported amongst people using it non-medically in the 1960s. And uh, this was when there was no real selection, no preparation of patients no control of doses, and often polydrug use in the background, so difficult to decide to what extent a lot of these adverse events were specific to uh, psychedelics as against uh, the effects of a variety of other drugs. Uh, the prevalence of these is probably fairly low if you look at the denominator and the large number of people who've experimented with these drugs. 
uh, one of the effects that was claimed in the late 60s that had a lot to do with LSD being classified in Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act was the claim that uh, it produced genetic uh, changes in, in users, which was not supported in better control studies. In the 2000s, adverse events uh, amongst recreational users are pretty rare. We don't see lots of these turning up in emergency departments for reasons that I think uh, are unclear, but possibly people using lower doses, better preparation and self-selection. Um, and adverse events have also been rarely reported in, in clinical trials and laboratory studies. But again, with the caution that a lot of these early studies have included substantial proportions of people with prior experience with psychedelics. So they may well understate the uh, rate of adverse events in people who have no prior experience. So the major limitations to research to date have been small sample studies, more often cross crossover studies than randomized control trials until very recently. They've been conducted by limited numbers of investigators, all of whom have been advocates. And that's all because of the difficulty in getting funding and the sort of uh, discouragement of research on this on these drugs. That's changing. I think there's a lot of philanthropic money. Pharmaceutical companies are becoming interested and that's creating problems of its own. And governments, including the government here in Australia, has set aside 15 million Australian dollars for clinical trials of these drugs in depression and other common mental disorders. So I think it will be a lot easier from here on in for researchers to get the funding required to do the large scale well controlled trials that we will need to assess the value of these drugs. We still don't know a lot about mechanisms of treatment. Um, it's surprising that one or two doses of a drug uh, given in the context of psychotherapeutic support can produce what appear to be high rates of sustained remission from uh, depression. There's a lot of resort to metaphors about resetting the brain or the default mode network, uh, clearly set in setting a, uh, critical to efficacy. So it's not simply a drug effect. Uh, it's, uh, and there are important questions about how much psychotherapy is required. And I guess the other interesting question is to what extent the spiritual experiences that many people report are uh, a requirement for therapeutic efficacy. That is, are they causal? or are they epiphenomenal in the sense that they might indicate that people have had an, received an adequate dose of the drug to produce um, necessary therapeutic effect. And of course, one might argue as a good empiricist, does it really matter as long as the drugs work? Uh, I guess that's a, a reasonable position to take, um, uh, worry about the mechanisms later. So how likely is it the psychedelics will be approved for medical use? Well, my guess would be if the results of these phase three trials that are underway hold up or as even a little bit less positive than the early studies, uh, we'd still have a, a promising new treatment to add to the treatment for intractable depression and to PTSD. Uh, then the issue I guess would be whether we allow the use of these treatments as first line without further trials. I think it would be hard to uh, stop that happening um, given the desperation that there's, there is amongst many patients who have failed to respond to conventional treatments. Um, there'll be a lot of pressure on doctors to prescribe and it will become an, an important issue as to who's allowed to prescribe. Is it only psychiatrists or will any family doctor or any uh, physician with some sort of training be permitted to, to do that? In the case of the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, I think the issue is the model that uh, Rick Doblin and colleagues have developed is a pretty expensive, extensive, you know, about a 15 hours plus of psychotherapy with two co-therapists, one male, one female. Uh, it makes it a pretty expensive option. Um, I think the pressure will be on for access to treatment of a shorter duration, probably with a simpler, more direct approach to psychotherapy some form of exposure-based treatment in the case of PTSD, for example, in the context of uh, taking MDMA. So how will the medical use of these drugs be regulated? Uh, one of the other reasons I got interested in this topic has been following what's happened with medical cannabis here in Australia, is that the pressure from advocates uh, for these drugs to allow early access to patients uh, 
or the prescription of these drugs as unapproved therapeutic goods has really uh, led to an explosion in the prescription of these drugs for many conditions for where there's very little, if any, evidence of efficacy uh, and being prescribed by people with very little experience in treating a lot of these uh, problems. Um, and there's, there's a lot of pressure here in Australia at the moment to allow the same uh, access to psychedelics as for medical cannabis, for anxiety disorders, addiction, and so on. Uh, and one could easily see if this does happen, that it, it begins under some sort of tight regulation and under the pressure of advocacy, it, it rapidly is relaxed and we end up with compassionate access to all sorts of psychedelic drugs, including psychedelic plants, and these treatments being used by a wide variety of uh, practitioners of varying levels of competence and, uh, and integrity. And I think the extent to that, which that happens, we might well end up with you know, bad news stories about these drugs um, that will lead to uh, tightening up on, on their use. And then of course, there's issues about whether the non-medical use of psychedelics will be allowed by the form of microdosing for wellness and creativity or for spiritual exploration. Um, and of course, we've got in, in the US, uh, a lot of interest, particularly in, in the use of these drugs for uh, exploration of mystical experiences, growing out of a lot of the early work, which was uh, intended uh, therapeutically in terminally ill patients. Um, and of course, the, the replication in 2006 of the Good Friday experiment um, is, it was what really kicked this off again. And of course, we, we have a renewed focus on the risks of irrational exuberance. And, and I think the, the underappreciated risk of these drugs is the heightened suggestibility of, of patients, both during therapeutic sessions and after taking psychedelics. Uh, and I think Matthew Johnson has described the, the guru temptation for therapists. And I certainly very much remember this in the early 1970s in Australia, people who started giving these drugs to various people and quickly assumed the, the roles of gurus and getting people involved in believing all sorts of improbable and, and crazy things. Uh, it, these drugs can produce radical changes in epistemic beliefs, as the philosophers like to say, and patients need to be made well aware of that. There's more interesting, I think, anthropological work coming out of Europe, the extent to which these drugs have been used by the alternate F, the right-wing extremists in, in Germany have been using psychedelic drugs to recruit followers. And there's been a, a resurgence of sexual abuse of patients, including one patient in the one of the MAPS trials of MDMA, PTSD, and a couple of allegations of the use of these, of sexual abuse amongst non-medical users of these uh, drugs here in Australia. We also see the sort of therapeutic grandiosity that can afflict some people who get involved in uh, doing research on these drugs, coming to believe that they'll change the world, cure humanity's ills. And we, we see worrying signs of a rebirth of the psychedelic evangelism that we saw in the 1960s and 70s. And I think the, the real risk there is that we'll end up repeating some of the errors of that period in provoking a public backlash and bans on the non-medical use of these drugs. The other issue, I think that certainly some people who are involved in advocating for the therapeutic use of these drugs are explicitly following the medical cannabis model in pursuing citizen initiated referenda to legalize psilocybin mushrooms. This has just happened in the state of Colorado. It's happened at city level in a number of uh, US states as well. And we've seen the medical cannabis companies in the US moving into plant-based psychedelics and adopting a lot of the similar marketing strategies. Um, and I think the extent to which this begins to happen um, will make it much more difficult to conduct therapeutic research on these drugs and to use these drugs in a therapeutic setting um, if some of these, these practices uh, get out of control. Uh, one could easily see a, a renewed interest in 
uh, pursuing the use of these drugs uh, for various religious purposes. Uh, one wouldn't hold one's breath on that getting up under the current Supreme Court, but uh, who knows. Um, I'll finish that, I'll ask some questions. I meant to say earlier that um, I think I did say that there's a series of papers that I've published on, on these issues, um, which are listed here uh, for those who might want to see um, the, the detail uh, to support the sorts of uh, arguments that I've put here. The one at the very bottom, which is cut off, is uh, available on the web for free download. It's a, a much longer document that contains uh, all, all the information that I've presented tonight. So I'm happy to entertain questions and comments. Oh, can you um, stop screen sharing, Wayne, and then we can... Oh, sure, yes. Sorry. If anyone wants to ask a question, they can come up. Um, but yeah, Mark has got a question online. Mark? Uh, he's got his hand up, anyway. Yeah, one sec. Um, hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Wayne. You, you mentioned that you signed um, something that was going to the US government about um, the Brazilian religion and ayahuasca use. Which, yeah. um, was that Santa Daime? Sorry, were they? Wait, which religion was that? Was that Santa Daime? Yeah, I think it was. I've just forgotten. I never pronounced the full Brazilian name. It was or was it Unio de Vegetal? Yeah, it was the, the Vegetal. It was 2006. Oh, and interesting. They, they made, okay. Yeah, they made a decision back then which upheld the right of that uh, religious group to use um, ayahuasca, that ayahuasca preparation in its religious rights. The, and do, I do you approve it. of that ruling? Well, I, I signed a, an amicus curiae brief in support of it. Um, yeah. I mean, at the, at the time, I didn't imagine that there'd be a whole lot of enthusiasm for uh, people taking a drug that made you vomit uh, uh, profusely into buckets for uh, you know, hours at a time. But, you know, so I didn't foresee the sort of drug tourism that's since grown up around it. I'm not as enthusiastic about uh, what's happened uh, around Ayahuasca. In, in, I, uh, yeah. I would presume that you, you were there as an expert, like a pharmacological expert. Yeah, I was just looking at it in terms of the, the sorts of risks uh, compared to other illicit drugs um, at, at the time, yeah. How would you, um, I know this isn't your expertise, but you mentioned, you, you, you um, and I agree with you, you had condemnatory attitude towards psychedelic cults, but then yeah. you've also signed this thing in 2006 about psychedelic religions. How would yeah. you go about distinguishing them? Uh, well, I mean, there's there's not a, a sharp red line between the two, is there? Uh, I mean, I guess, you know, the difference between a religion and a cult is is probably 10 or 15 years. You know, if a cult persists and survives, the, uh, you, there's some sort of transmission of the practices beyond the founder, then you, you've got something that looks more like a religion but rather than, than as a cult. Uh, right, because, I mean, I'd probably distinguish it in terms of coercion. Like the extent of coercion that's involved. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, there's certainly there's there's been worries around that with some of the you know, drug tourism, and, and mm. certainly it's not a topic I'd claim to be an expert in. But some of the uh, more pop the the better quality journalism that's been written around it certainly raises some some causes for concern, and, th and there's been deaths because of uh, negligence in in the way in which people have been given these drugs and. And not treated when they when they developed uh, serious medical complications from vomiting and uh, and so on. Interesting. Thank you very much. Someone is it Lee? Got his hand up. Ask a question, and Lee, we have an online question. Hi, uh, Wayne. Thank you for that. That was a, a beautifully balanced presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about this irrational exuberance, mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was really interesting that you sort of reframed the narrative about why 
psychedelics, maybe the research into psychedelics stopped um, in the 60s and 70s. And it's not just because of the war on drugs, but maybe perhaps to do with some arrogance um, surrounding what these drugs can do. And do you think this kind of, this can, this, this could scupper progress now with psychedelic research, this kind of exuberance? Because you don't need to look very far to see it. You just need to go onto Twitter for a moment. And yeah, I mean, I, I was been very interested to see that both Matthew Johnson and I, there's a, an, another leading researcher's name I've just forgotten at the moment, people who are actively involved in doing clinical research on these drugs who've written editorial pieces trying to puncture what they see as the overhyping of these drugs and warning that uh, if people do start to make uh, exuberant claims about their efficacy and, and so on, that this could undermine uh, the, the potential clinical use. So I, I, I think... And, and I've been, well, it started at the beginning of COVID 2020 that I started looking at a lot of this, um, these issues and, and reading in, in this field. And it's become clear to me over the last couple of years that that really is a movement that's grown. Um, well, that, that sort of risk is, has grown with some very high profile advocates here, particularly in Australia, who are making pretty strong claims about these and demanding that patients be given access to these drugs before they've been uh, uh, evaluated in clinical trials. And so, I, think, I think there is a real risk if that's allowed to happen, that uh, it, it could redound to the discredit of, of, I would, I would, of good research. Can I ask another follow-up question? What could we do to oh. encourage people who are not necessarily advocates to do research in this, this area? Uh, I think money helps. Um, <laughs> And I think that certainly, I know in the case in Australia that the uh, decision by the federal government to allocate $15 million for research on these drugs attracted a lot of people into doing research who wouldn't, uh, on these drugs, who were doing clinical research in related areas. And I think that's what you want. Um, you know, people who are experienced in doing clinical trials who know something about the particular treatment of the disorders for which these drugs are being used. And you know, I don't think there's a problem with with people being advocates for them. I just think that it would be good to have you know balanced research teams where you've got advocates and sort of more skeptical investigators as part of the group, um, just to sort of to head off the phenomena I mentioned earlier that you know clinical trials funded by pharmaceutical companies produce better results than trials done by people who don't have a financial or personal or other investment in the outcome of the trials. And uh, I think that. Money is a, a very potent incentive to get, get people involved. That and, and the, for the effects of the drugs. I mean, I think, you know, they, even if, if you discount the, the sort of very positive results in the early trials and say, let's assume that the drugs are half as effective as, as the early trials suggest, that's still a pretty promising outcome with treatment of common mental disorders for which existing treatments aren't fabulously effective. So I, I think there, there is interest uh, in the broader psychiatric profession and people who treat depression and PTSD in doing research on these drugs. So I think uh, the combination of the money and the attraction to the potential therapeutic benefits will make it a lot easier to do the sort of trials that, that, that are needed. And I, I'm encouraged by the, the two trials, the, the trial that I heard Celia Morgan present uh, in Darwin just a couple of weeks ago and the uh, Bergen Schultz uh, trial that was was just been recently published as well. They are serious investigators, and the results of those trials look pretty credible to me. And I think we'll see more uh, results uh, from trials conducted in similar ways now that the money's coming and the, there's a lot more interest. And, and and that will continue, I think, provided we can sort of keep a lid on some of the crazier stuff that that people might be inclined to say, you know, particularly in the popular media. Okay, thank you for that. I'll hand back over to this serious researcher. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that. Very credible results. Um, yeah, in Australia, the movement, I, I mind mentioned, but perhaps we can talk about that later because I know Lee's been waiting patiently. And we see you there as well, Adrian, as well. I'm not ignoring you guys. Lee was first. <laughs> hi, hi, Wayne. Uh, thanks for that. I'm a big fan of your critique of the brain disease model, but uh, that's, a, that's another story. So, 
I'm interested in regulatory capture and uh, the decisions of the government uh, or state decisions of whether to allow access or not, uh, if, whether it's based on a, a cost benefit analysis of, you know, sort of health benefits to uh, the potential harms uh, mm. and whether, um, w whether they would use considerations other than that cost benefit calculation, uh, such as uh, the utility of the drug in terms of social control. I mean, it's stopping people agitating for social reforms uh, that might produce the same therapeutic benefits, but through systemic reform for things like inequality. But the, mm. the analogy there is the sort of SOMA in Aldous Huxley's 1984, yeah. if I believe, was, it, was a, a form of social control. But, I mean, do you see that? Brave, in brave New World. Yeah, Brave New World was the SOMA. Drug. I mean, Huxley, that was interesting because Huxley was very pessimistic to begin with uh, in that early book. He became much more optimistic in Ireland, which was a book that he published just before he died, uh, which had, a, I think, an overly optimistic view about uh, the uses of drugs. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, well, I think the regulatory decisions around these drugs uh, uh, if they're, they're usually followed, it will be around cost, cost effect, well, effectiveness, safety, and cost effectiveness will uh, determine whether they're publicly subsidised or not. The worry is, and we've seen it particularly with medical cannabis, is that people use, uh, exploit systems which are really designed to give patients early access to drugs that are being clinically evaluated, typically in, in the case of life-threatening illnesses such as cancer those provisions are being used to uh, basically shovel huge quantities of these drugs out into the community under without any supervision or evaluation at all. And I think that's the bigger worry if, uh, if governments um, basically bend to uh, advocate pressure and allow these drugs to be prescribed as unapproved therapeutic goods. I think that's what we'll, we'll see with psychedelics, given the demand that there is out there for patients with depression, which is not well treated with, say, SSRIs or existing antidepressant drugs. Uh, and I think it's, you know, they've picked two conditions where there's a lot of, uh, a lot of pretty desperate patients. Uh, and the, the press, of, press on these drugs is just so uncritical um, uh, and so positive. Uh, you, you wouldn't be surprised if you were in, in the setting where you had one of those disorders, you'd be knocking government's doors down to get access to it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think the, the use of these drugs to contain political dissent, I mean, I think if you're wanting to sort of tranquilize the, the population, the best way would be to legalize very potent cannabis. That's a, a drug that would accomplish that, that end very effectively. And uh, I think that's one of the worries I have about drug legalize or cannabis legalization, particularly if super potent forms of drugs, um, which we're, we, we're seeing a lot of the heavy use concentrated amongst the most disadvantaged members of the, the community. I would have thought the democratic clamouring for access would, would force the regulator's hand to some degree, but I'm glad to hear that you think that uh, government is essentially immune from corruption. Oh, <laughs> I don't know, not for corruption. I mean, they, they submit to pressure. Um, and they clearly have in the case of medical cannabis. There it's the, the sick kid card, as the industry calls it. Uh, you know, who wants to get in the way of a, a mother of a child with intractable epilepsy and accessing uh, cannabidiol? Yeah, which with, with there's, where there is evidence of efficacy. Um, but, you know, that, those sorts of cases are used as a sort of a, a, a wrecking ball to get through the door to then open up uh, the, the client, the uh, access to cannabis for everything else, when you look at the reasons that most people are using it med medically are chronic pain, uh, anxiety, depression, where the evidence of efficacy is very, very weak. Uh, the clinical trial suggests it's better than placebo, but not by much. Adrian, will you allow me to jump in here with my question? Because it is sort of related and ask you after. I think I have- Of a course, yeah. of course. <laughs> But my question follows on from this and is about the, the, we've been talking or you've been talking in the last, uh, most of this talk about drugs as 
psychedelics were just drugs. But of course, the whole protocol is usually, and I know their efforts to do actually achieve exactly that, that they become just drugs. But in mm -hmm. psych assisted sort of uh, in psychedelic assisted therapy, one of the problems and maybe one of the key aspects is that you have the psychotherapy with it. It's not just drugs. We are not talking about mm. introducing into the clinic just a new drug machine like an SSRI. We are talking about, and we know this is one of the biggest obstacles, that there would be 15 hours or more of maybe substantially more in many cases of very deep seating illnesses that people are struggling from. And I mean, partly the problem with in the last 40 years was that, of course, everybody that too much power is given to the pharmaceutical industry when you ask me, and that psych psychotherapies, psychological treatments, counseling were always pushed to the side or tried to be minimized as much as possible. So, because we are talking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, I think we need to think about what might actually makes the change. It's not just the chemi chemical, we are not arguing this. I mean, hardly anybody is. It is so important to have the chemical experience within a different, and that is a person-to-person -person treatment framework in which relationships of trust and actually talking through things, experiences with the drug, but also the experiences that are related to the illness are being brought up. So how can we square that circle that you've said about? So regulation is one thing, and this is why I think psychedelics shouldn't and can't be like cannabis. Yeah? They really play in a somewhat different league, in a league that's actually not much used, that in the last 40 years, the psychopharmaceutical industry has actually always been working against. And so with the challenge these treatments are facing, it's sort of on more than one level. And I would like you to tell me something, how you see that in comparison to the history you have been presenting from the 50s, 60s and 70s to where we are now. And the sort of a chance that this psychotherapy, mm -hmm. and the meaning making on top of the drug is actually relevant. Well, I mean, I think that's, that's true. I mean, it's, people certainly pay lip service to the idea that it's not just the drug, that it's a package, it's a psychotherapy. Uh, and, and drug package, but all the regulators think about it as the drugs because that's what they're used to evaluate. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that the, the early experimentation, the Osman and Hoffer approach, the form of psychotherapy there was Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, so the, the very early uses were explicitly seen as part of uh, psychotherapeutic drug package. And in the 50s, that wasn't unusual. A lot of psychotherapists or psychodynamically oriented psychotherapists use drugs to facilitate recovery of unconscious memories of various sorts. And of course, LSD fitted within that sort of model at the time. But of course, the whole movement since then has been to regulate uh, and evaluate drugs as drugs. And a lot of the early trials of LSD by the skeptics, that was all they did. They just gave people drugs on the assumption that was the active therapeutic ingredient. Uh, and I, I fear that you know that we'll see a recurrence of that. Uh, I guess given the popular media accounts of this, tend to emphasise it's the drug rather than the drug and the psychotherapy uh, that's the active ingredient. So, and regulators are not really attuned to regulating this sort of package uh, of, of treatment. Um, so I think that will be a challenge. It'll be a lot easier to get the drugs approved for use in the treatment of these disorders as drugs than it will be for regulators to approve specific packages uh, of uh, the administration of these drugs wrapped, wrapped in, in some form of psychotherapy. Ben, I was just, just going to just more of a comment because um, we've been speaking to the regulators actually about means of regulating psychological therapy and I think it's yeah, such a huge issue an odd thing, I think they're not perceived as, as risky potentially as drugs, but there are certainly harms from psychological therapy. Maybe, I don't know, if they're on the scale of like pharmaceutical harms and, and full pharmacological harms, I'm not sure. I know we've really looked at that. And so it is quite a struggle to get um, regulators to consider regulating psychological therapy. But I mean, we've been speaking to our medicine health regulatory authority here with Ketamine. Well, they are considering, I mean, there's a precedent, I think, with buprenorphine, the FDA 
have the label for that says the drug plus psychosocial support, but it's not well defined. And that's another mm-hmm. issue in this whole field. I think that a lot of the therapies, I mean, the MAPS trial, the therapy is really ill defined. So, yeah, I think that's, I was just, just a comment on some, yeah, that's some recent work we've been trying to do. But it's really odd that, that regulators, you know, that psychological therapy isn't as regulated, really. <laughs> I don't know, we've got some psychologists here, <laughs> psychiatrists, so, but um, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I just thought, I'd, I'd, and I'll, I'll hand over to you in a minute, Alex. I'll hand over to Adrian first because he's been waiting some patient mate. Oh, and then Rennie, sorry. <laughs> terrible question, monitor. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, just want to echo what Jane said, and um, thank you for such a, a balanced and, and sort of well presented and well researched um, uh, presentation this morning. Um, Lee had cued me up beautifully. Um, to talk about uh, your mentions of Aldous Huxley, which have come up um, in there. And just to declare an interest, I've been sort of looking into uh, Osmond and Huxley for, for some time now. Uh, but just wanted to make a, a quick observation that, that one of the interesting things about um, Huxley's experience was that um, he was he was well aware of uh, the existence of um, sort of mind altering drugs and very keen to use them, but was always put off um, as a sort of sickly child and adult by what might happen because he'd, he'd read in a, a book um, called Fantastica that, that sort of looked at the history of indigenous use of um, of psychedelics and and how often they made you sick and didn't really want to do that. So so the relationship between um, Osmond and Huxley really came about when he realised they'd uh, they'd managed to synthesise something that could give you the upsides without the downsides. Yeah. Um, interesting, but but just to come back to Lee's point about um, about about soma and the issue of sort of social control is of course that um, you know Huxley came from a family uh, with with eugenicists of, of varying degrees on either side. Um, and the issue of um, sort of drugs as a, as a social control. Um, was something that he 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 had um, written about since you know since the early 1940s, and in fact one of the things he said was that you know the um, that our, our primitive um, our, our, our primitive ancestors really had to find drugs to escape to provide some escape from physical hardship, um, and and so it, it, of course in um, in Brave New World, soma for the the low caste the epsilons was something to get them past the menial and physical tasks that they had to do. Whereas for the upper castes, it was a, a means of, um, of just escaping boredom. So in terms of sort of showing how you've got pain at one end and boredom at the other. And so yeah. it was used as a sort of blank, blanket world drug to get people around them, which is very interesting in the context of today's um today's debate which of course there is there is there is two sides of it there's there's therapeutic and there's sort of self-actualization and creativity there's the silicon valley sort of micro dosing and then there's 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 people suffering from sort of anorexia and treatment resistant depression um for whom this is an absolute necessity um to be able to do it so i just i just thought in terms of your 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 mentions of huxley there, there's sort of more to it than meets the eye both through his um through his personal um, interaction and his willingness to do so only really when he knew he wasn't going to get terribly sick and and yeah. also his view his view of it across society which is something that resonates today yeah and i mean i mean i there's i got interested in huxley as well and read some of the letters that the, the published letters between uh, osman and huxley which i didn't get through all of them uh, they they became fairly repetitive pretty quickly but mm. yeah yeah, I, I hadn't realised until that the the extent to which uh, Huxley had been an influence on both uh, Osman but also Leary. Uh, I mean, uh, less so Leary than than Osman. Uh, was a critical figure behind the scenes, uh, I think, in popularising psychedelic drugs and and building support for their use. I think he organised Sidney Cohen to give the drug uh, to give LSD to uh, Henry Luce as well. Um, so sort of and, and he and Osmond the uh, trickle down effect was yeah that was that was sort of part of what it was all about the trickle down theory of enlightenment um mm. if we can get the, the 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 people who rule the world to use these drugs and open their minds then we can improve the lot of people further down the social tree but we don't want to go spreading the drugs around too widely because right. uh, people might misuse them or misinterpret them <laughs> 
absolutely. Thank you again, then. Hi, Wayne. Um, I'm one of those crazy exuberant advocates that you speak of. <laughs> um, and I think this is due to certain ineffable experiences. Um, so what weight do you place on people's ineffable experiences that might make them passionate? So the, the subjective versus this sort of empirical research. Um, yeah, um, and, and, and what is uh, your personal experience with these substances, if any? Thank you. Well, I certainly had the ineffable experiences back in the early 1970s with both LSD and with psilocybin. Uh, I, I didn't, uh, you know, they didn't radically transform my view of the world, I guess, in the way they did some of my peers. I mean, I sort of found them very interesting experiences. Um, and I guess I had the sort of experiences of, you know, the, the profundity that, that dissolved in, in the daylight uh, the day after and and seeing what some of these experiences did for other people just sort of made me turn off the idea that one should put a, a great deal of weight on them. So I guess that's where I, I come from in terms of attitudes towards that. But I guess in terms of sort of broader political views, um, and I think there's a case to be made for adults being allowed to have these sorts of experiences, and, and I guess the challenges in finding ways that these drugs are, can be made available that don't lend themselves to the sorts of misuses of cults and coercive use that um, they can be uh, put to. Do you think, a very, very quick question on that, do you think the medical regulation would undermine any movement for kind of broader decriminalisation or regulation? I, mean, well, I, I think it's more, I think it's more likely that the you know, any broader movement for deregulation or decriminalisation is likely to undermine medical use. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't think the regulators are able to control or prevent simply by uh, approving these drugs for therapeutic use. I think that the bigger risk is from uh, use outside the medical setting, uh, any social tolerance for, I think, misadventures in, in that sort of setting will put at risk the therapeutic uses of these drugs. Oh, is that another question, Lee, by the way? Or... Yeah, I was, I was hoping to ask another question, but if I'm hogging the limelight, tell me. You wanna, um, Alex is going to ask a couple of people from the audience, and then, yeah, no, I didn't know if it was a legacy. Just checking. Thank you, Hi, thank you uh, for the presentation. I just, I was wondering before, while asking a question, you you mentioned how studies conducted by pharmaceutical companies provide better results. And although I understand what you mean by that, I would like to elaborate a bit because in my opinion, I think even studies by pharmaceutical companies can provide some form of bias. Like I think these types of companies could have something to benefit, whether it's for or against the legalization of the substance. Well, that was exactly the point I was making, uh, that they get better results, meaning the results look a lot more positive than they do when people who don't have the pharmaceutical industry's interest in the drug repeat the clinical trials. So that's exactly the point I was trying to make. Positive in what sense? Well, the results are a lot better than they are on average when people who aren't sort of committed to, the, don't have a financial interest in the drug, do the trials. And it's, it's, it's probably for a variety of reasons. They One thing, they, they select patients so that they exclude patients with complicated histories who are like, unlikely to respond to their drugs. Uh, and they probably also engage at times in malpractice in the sense of suppressing clinical trial results which aren't as positive as they should be. So I'm not suggesting the pharmaceutical, though in drawing the analogy was saying the same sorts of phenomena that I, you know, people are critical of advocates of psychedelics can occur with pharmaceutical companies. That was precisely my point. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, do you want, do you have another, another question from the audience? And then Lee, you can ask. <laughs> uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, this might be a little bit left of center question, but um, you were talking very briefly or mentioned in passing the uh, causal versus epiphenomenal, um, you know, experience of the mystical. Um, my question is essentially based on if, if 
these mystical experiences are causal and if these mystical experiences are to some extent uh, a, a real thing using that word a bit flippantly which obviously is dependent on your you know metaphysical beliefs the uh, current discussion that we've been having within the paradigm of the medicalization and the, uh, the psychiatric is somewhat dismissive of those kind of uh, almost Terence McKenna-esque claims. Uh, do you think there's room within um, the medical discussion to talk about that, or do you think that's more um, should be constrained within the philosophy department rather than the medical one? Oh, you going to... Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I guess as an empiricist, you know, the, the first question is, do the drugs work? Um, and the second question is, you know, why or how? Uh, and I imagine that there's likely to be a whole variety of competing explanations if, if they prove to be reasonably effective uh, in, involving you know, a, a wide range of things from the sort of more spiritual, um, uh, psychical, uh, psychic, psychic, uh, psychotherapeutic uh, explanations through to uh, ones that, that look at synapses and um, brain networks and so on. Thanks. Yeah, but I, I, would, I wouldn't think, you know, if the evidence sort of points strongly to these experiences being a, a necessary condition for therapeutic effects, I don't think that would stop people using them. Um, it, it might be, it might change the way people think about how the drugs act and what they think they're getting when they agree to a trial of them for the treatment of some condition. With, uh, with that in mind, would you say that um, the, the, the sort of push towards distilling these um, substances or finding uh, like analogs of them that produce the same effects without the phenomenological experience that I believe is currently being researched heavily um, by ph uh, pharmaceutical companies, would you say that that could potentially be harmful uh, if the spiritual is, you know, valid in some way? I don't know about harmful, but possibly a waste of money. I mean, we've had a what, 150 years uh, sort of attempt on the part of the therapeutic uh, of the pharmaceutical industry to develop drugs that produce opioid effects that are not uh, dependence producing. It might not be possible to separate the the therapeutic effect of these drugs from the sort of mystical experience that goes with them i mean it's more likely that they'll be wasting their time they'll generate all sorts of interesting compounds that act on uh, 5h2ta2a receptors but don't have any therapeutic effects of the sort that, that we're interested in thank you very much <laughs> Um, Leeds, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, so my, my uh, question follows on from that a little bit. So I'm thinking of Joanna Moncrief's The Myth of the Chemical Cure, and she mm -hmm. insists that all, all therapeutic uh, drugs so far are just active placebo effects. You feel something, you want to get better, and the expectation, uh, expectation then drives your changes in your responses, the therapeutic outcome that you see. So she insists on tr clinical trials with an active placebo control mm -hmm. condition. I I'm always on the lookout. So whenever anyone says, oh, something is therapeutic or works, I'm saying, well, is that in a, uh, an active placebo controlled trial or not? And I haven't seen any. And I mean, have you seen any? And, and do you think that all of the effects that have so far been reported as being you know, therapeutic effects could all of them be explained as an active placebo effect in the way that Moncrief has argued? Uh, I doubt all of the effects of all of the, you know, all of the drugs that are used in psychiatry are wholly active placebo. But I think there is a, a, a fairly substantial placebo effect for all the drugs that we're talking about. We know that with antidepressants, the SSRIs, that you give uh, patients with uh, depression a uh, these drugs, uh, a placebo, then you get a substantial minority who show responses. I mean, interestingly, in the, the area of medical cannabis, that uh, the trials of uh, the CBD and the treatment of these epileptic syndromes, there's substantial placebo effect in those trials. And you would, would have thought that a, you know, a convulsive disorder was, was the least likely to produce uh, placebo uh, effects. So I think there are placebo effects across a wide variety of, of disorders, including a lot of the common mental disorders. But I think there probably is also some 
active therapeutic ingredients. So I think it's a pretty strong claim to say that all drug, all so-called drug effects are active placebo. But I, I would agree that active placebo is a is a component of a lot of uh, drug effects, or at least part of the explanation. There is, well, if it's okay to chip in. Did you want to say something else, Nee? No, I was just going to say there's recent studies that tried <laughs> that with psychedelics. So the Bogan Shoot study used diphenhydramine, yeah. um, which is you know, like a sedative antihistamine. But it's, I mean, yeah, I guess there's two points really that is really difficult to control for these effects, especially as we think they're the key therapeutic effects. But also, what are we controlling for? Is it a bit reductionist to just be controlling for you know, these drug effects when we've acknowledged the complexity of the interaction between, say, sets and setting? You know, the people have advocated for these culture controlled trials. So, yeah, maybe we have to just rethink the way that we design these trials completely. Or maybe, I mean, you, I, I was interested in your point, Wayne, really, that the flaws of this approach for psychedelics. I mean, maybe these trials will never be able to provide sufficient evidence <laughs> for, for the, I don't know if for the regulators, um, but generally to be convinced and, and maybe we need a different approach. I don't know what that is. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. I guess there's real world data. But... Well, I think the, I mean, the FDA have indicated that they're prepared to accept results of trials, the absence of round, uh, a placebo, true placebo. And I think, yeah, realistically you have to, I, I, I think, Insisting on you know double blind trials as the only uh, sort of standard of evidence in this particular case would probably be be dumb. Uh, I think probably thinking about comparing psychedelics with existing approved treatments, which have been evaluated against placebo, is probably the next best thing. I mean, patients won't be blind as to what they're receiving, but if if the evaluators are, then that sort of tends to minimise the the effect of that sort of bias. Lee, did you want to still got your hand? Put your hand down. <laughs> no, no, I'm pretty much done, but thank you for that. Cheers. Um, any other questions? Chris, you got no, right. no, yeah. any other questions from the audience? Or um, well, because obviously as well, it's uh, is it now 9:30 on a Friday night, Wayne? So we'll um, let you go. But thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. And <laughs> Well, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the stimulating questions. I very much enjoyed the experience. Oh, well, thanks for coming. Hope you'll get you in there. Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank yeah. you. Thank thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, wait. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye.